Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. So, um, I'm not going to speak about a particular fluid per se, but more or less uh, talk about hyper hyperchloremia and its association with poor outcomes. These are my disclosures, funding from the NIH, um, some sepsis related biomarker patents, and then uh, some scientific advisory board appointments. So, this is a screenshot of the medical, electronic medical record, and I put it up here just to illustrate this common problem of hyperchloridia, patients who have very high chloride levels uh, persistently while in the ICU. And we'll talk about this quite a bit this morning, but this is a multifactorial process, but probably the most common cause of hyperchloridia is the use of, uh, <clears throat> of normal saline or 0.9% sodium chloride. And so if you look through our literature, you can see, uh, especially in the adult literature, there's quite a few papers associating hyperchloremia uh, with poor outcomes. So this is a paper from John Kellum's group looking at a general uh, uh, ICU population who underwent large volume resuscitation and higher chloride content of the fluid was associated with reduced survival. This is another study uh, looking at surgical patients, non-cardiac surgical patients, and again, hyperchloremia associated with poor outcomes, in this case mortality. And this is more isolated in patients with septic shock uh, or in movement sepsis, again, associating hyperchloremia with, uh, with increased mortality. This is all adult literature. And really, uh, until recently, there wasn't much uh, in the pediatric literature, but I'll show you some of that data. So what's the mechanism? Uh, I believe the next speaker is going to talk quite a bit about the mechanisms as it relates to um, acute kidney injury, but certainly there's an element of hyper, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. That alone shouldn't increase mortality, but it's, it's a significant abnormality. There's evidence for reduced renal blood flow, um, evidence for coagul coagulopath, coagulopathy, um, also evidence for a pro-inflammatory state, um, altered neutrophil function, impaired cardiac contractility, and reduced gastric blood flow. So all sort of associations and reports in the literature, but the point here, for me at least, is that there isn't really any one unifying mechanism that says hyperchloremia hurts you in this way. I think it's a culmination of, of issues. So this is Aaron Stenson, who is a fellow in our program, is now a faculty member uh, at the uh, University of Colorado, and she looked at this issue in critically ill kids with septic shock, and she looked at almost 900 patients who had at least three separate chloride values over three days during the initial seven days of illness. She treated hyperchloremia as a dichotomous variable above or below 110 millimoles per liter, and she extracted the minimum, maximum, and mean levels, and then used statistic regression to look to see if there was an association with uh, hyperchloremia mortality, adjusting for baseline illness severity, meaning what we call the PRISM score, which is analogous to Apache. So interestingly, a majority of these patients or these children, at, at least at one point, the maximum chloride was greater than 110, so pretty, pretty prevalent. If you look at the mean chloride, about a fifth of them, on average, had high chloride levels. And what was remarkable to me is that almost 10% the minimum chloride was greater than 110, meaning that throughout their entire initial seven days in the ICU, they had hyperchloremia at all times, at least when we measured. And so this is the association here. The overall mortality was 10%. The maximum chloride, in other words, if you were hyperchloremic at least one point, that was not associated with outcome. But if your mean was higher than 110, there was an association with the mortality. And if your minimum chloride was greater than 110, meaning that the entire time you were over 110, the association was even stronger. Erin also looked at this outcome called complicated course, which is a composite of mortality as well as persistent multi-organ failure at seven days, with an overall rate of 25%. And again, no effect with maximum chloride or minimum, I'm sorry, or mean, but if your minimum chloride was greater than 110, there was an association with this composite outcome of complicated course. And so usually when I see this, I think, well, sicker kids or sicker patients are more likely to have electrolyte abnormalities, and sicker patients are more likely to have poor outcomes. So all of these associations are, might just be confounding by illness severity. And there's probably an element of truth to that. 
But the, the, the evidence is starting to become pretty compelling. And so we address this by taking another approach of rather than using a, a physiology score, we used a biomarker score, this thing that we call Persevere, which is a multi-biomarker um, risk model to estimate mortality probability in kids with sepsis. And so we repeated this analysis by adjusting for baseline mortality risk in sepsis as measured by Persevere. And we saw the same thing. The minimum chloride was associated with um, poor outcome even after adjusting for Persevere as was the mean. And then the minimum chloride rate of 110 was associated with complicated pores. And even if we adjust by both either PRISM or this thing that we developed Persevere, we see a similar association. Ellen also looked at kidney injury. Uh, this were a little bit over 600 kids. And we looked at KDGO stage two or three on day three of septic shock. Um, 125 or 20% of these kids had met this criteria of, uh, of AKI on day three. Again, using distic regression, adjusting for both severity of illness as well as age. And again, she found an association. So again, the minimum chloride greater than 110 was associated with increased risk of AKI on day three. And this was, again, stage two or three, as, as was the mean. And so shortly after we published this paper, another group in Denver um, independently published a similar study or similar observations showing that increases in chloride from, from baseline are associated with poor outcome in critically ill kids. So now there's certainly a lot of data in adults, and we're seeing very similar data emerging in critically ill children. So some thoughts and suggestions for whatever it's worth. Uh, the mechanisms by which hyperchloremia causes poor outcomes, at least in my mind, are a bit vague. There's sort of a constellation of problems that it's caused, but there isn't really a unifying uh, mechanism there. There's a large amount of data linking hyperchloremia with poor outcomes um, in critically ill patients, whether you look at mortality or AKI or other patient-centered outcomes. And we're seeing this in both medical as well as surgical patients. We're seeing this in sepsis. Now we're seeing in both kids and adults. The important thing, I think, from a pragmatic standpoint is that this is a modifiable factor. This is something that we can potentially control amongst our patients. And so what should we do? Should we abandon normal saline? I'm sure we'll debate this quite a bit today. My opinion is no. Okay? We have a lot of history with normal saline. Everybody in this room, I think, can claim that they've improved the outcomes or saved a lot of lives of a lot of patients over the years. So, in my opinion, we should not just outright abandon the uh, Should we conduct more trials comparing normal saline to balanced fluids? I know this is a controversial topic. Again, my opinion is no. There are many, many more burning questions in our field, many more complicated questions, many more compelling questions. I don't think we need to um, spend a lot of time, resources, and effort doing these kinds of studies. No disrespect intended to, toward anybody. This is my opinion. I believe our host agrees with that. Um, so what I advocate for is to take a pragmatic approach where we simply monitor chlorides and then adjust our resuscitation fluids as our chloride values increase, similar to what we do with potassium or, or sodium or other electrolytes. And so very simply, I think that you should use normal saline to an initial resuscitation if you wish. I don't think there's a problem with that. And then simply monitor chloride concentrations. Is your serum chloride getting to a level that you don't like? So if it's 110, if the answer is yes, then change your fluids. Change to LR, change to plasma light, and there's other concoctions that people are coming up with. And as John Lee will speak at the end, of, there isn't a perfect fluid, but I think we can adjust like we adjust many other things. And if the answer is no, then continue using normal saline if you wish. I think, I think that's OK, but I, I might be in a minute. <clears throat> so, take home messages. This is a common problem in our patients. Normal saline is the, is, is the most likely cause. There are now multiple studies demonstrating an association between hyperchloremia and poor outcomes across a variety of types of patients, including children and adults. The mechanisms to me are, are a bit vague, but nonetheless, this association is, is pretty strong and I think getting to the point of being compelling. And again, the most important thing is this is something that we can modify in our patients. So we should carefully consider whether we need more trials comparing fluid X to normal saline or fluid Y to normal saline versus just taking a pragmatic approach, common sense, 
and you basically monitor our hypocrine and monitor the chloride and change the fluids from the chloride. I'll be interested to see what others have to say. So I think that's it. Thank you very much.